Hello, everybody. Welcome tonight. We have a very special guest with us, Juliana. Hey, Juliana. Hi. Hi, Julie. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Uh, so I am in Los Angeles, uh, and Juliana, where are you? I'm in Brazil, in Salvador, Bahia. <laughs> Brazil! So yeah. cool, so cool. So um, welcome, everybody, tonight, wherever you are, please put into the uh, Facebook comments where you're tuning in from. It's really fun to see all the different locations people watch uh, and join us for these broadcasts. And it's special for Juliana to be able to go back and see all the different locations um, in the comments. Uh, please also like the video, give us lots of thumbs up, give us hearts, uh, share the video to your page too, if you can. Uh, that way um, we'll reach more people with our message tonight. Um, just a few more housekeeping before Juliana gets started with her story. Um, it, please, as Juliana is sharing her story, write comments in of what's resonating with you and your experience. Uh, please just also remember that the comments do stay with the video uh, and it's public. So you don't wanna share anything in the comments that you wouldn't wanna share publicly. And um, of course, as Juliana is sharing her story, if you have questions that come up about your own experience or experience of a loved one, uh, please remember that we do these videos for education and awareness purposes. Uh, but if you have questions about your own um, medical situation, please bring those questions to your sleep specialist or your doctor. Um, let's see if there's anything else from Project Sleep. Um, we had a really successful Giving Tuesday campaign. So thank you to everyone who helped support Giving Tuesday um, donations. We had a major gift match. Uh, and I just recently just calculated how much we got uh, of that gift match. And um, we've raised over $11,000 uh, since Giving Tuesday. And so that we are about 75% to our goal of raising 15,000. So uh, very exciting. And we will uh, continue the gift match through the end of the year. Uh, so there's still a little bit more time if, if you wanna get your donation in to be matched. Um, and we had a wonderful event with Dr. Mignot and Kenya Gredningo earlier uh, this week. So if uh, you didn't catch that, that will be available as well. Um, and I can't think of any other major updates for Project Sleep. We're just trying to finish out the year. Uh, and get ready for next year. So uh, really excited to have Juliana sharing her story with you guys tonight. Um, and Juliana, I think if you wanna go ahead and pull up your slides, <clears throat> I will uh, read your bio and we can go ahead and get started. Okay. Can you see it? <laughs> yeah, perfect. So this is such a special broadcast. Um, really excited to introduce you guys. So Juliana Angeline Neves is a lawyer uh, from Bahia, Brazil, who loves dogs, music, movies, and reading. She was diagnosed with narcolepsy at age 24 and hopes to promote understanding and acceptance of the condition. As a speaker with Project Sleep's Rising Voices of Narcolepsy program, she shares her journey to diagnosis and how she is learning to live with narcolepsy. So without further ado, take it away, Juliana. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. I'm really. Sorry, I muted you instead of me. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> okay. Um, sorry. <laughs> so I'm really excited to be here today. Thank you very much. Um, as you said, I'm from Salvador, Bahia, in Brazil, and I was raised by a very loving family. Um, that's me with my dad, my mom, and my stepdad. They were a big part of my life. They are a big part of my life. Um, I used to love to um, watch movies and series and to read. And I thought I would be a journalist or a writer. When I was nine, I even wrote a book 
that was called From Child to Child, The Adventures of Carol. <laughs> and that's a picture of me um, auto uh, autographing my book. And next to me is my grandma, who is an actual writer. <laughs> um, so I love animals too. My, my dad taught me how to ride horses and he gave me my first pets, um, this poodle called Minnie, two turtles and three ticks. <laughs> um, I was never really good um, at sports, but I found myself really happy when I start dancing. And that's a photo of me dancing flamenco. <laughs> so as a child, I used to have really scary nightmares, lots of nightmares. And um, they were so frightening that I couldn't put myself to sleep again unless my mom suited me and they became so frequent that my stepdad gave me this little ghost in the photo and this ghost had a flashlight head so when I woke up from a nightmare I used to push the ghost belly so his flashlight had lead my way to my mom's bedroom. Um, I remember a special nightmare that repeated itself for so many nights and it was about an evil clown that was, um, this clown was chasing me and that was so frightening. I remember that I always hid under my, under my grandma's bed. And then when he was just about to find me, I could even see his clown feet. I wake up every single time and this evil clown is scary until these days to me. Um, as a teenage, I realized some, I don't know, maybe when I was 15 or 16 years old, that I, my, my sleep nights were not okay. Um, I used to wake up during the night every hour or every two hours for no reason, apparently. So I woke up, look at the, the clock beside my bed and it was midnight and I just a few seconds later, I fell asleep again. And then I woke up and it was one o'clock and it was just like this. So I talked to my mom about it and she took me to a neurologist. Um, the neurologist asked me to do a test. So I spent a night in a hospital with lots of wires all over my body. And I remember that during that night, I woke up a few times. I even watched TV for half an hour or something and turned off the TV and went back to sleep. But when the test results came out, the doctor told me that I uh, um, didn't woke up at all during the night and I was okay. But that, that made me feel really insecure about my memories and confused. But I decided to move on and I was glad that my mom never doubted, never doubted me, not for one second. Well, um, a few years later, when I was 24, I started feeling some dizziness. I remember this day when I was at the supermarket picking up some fruit and I start feeling dizzy. It was really weird because it was not like I was with low blood pressure or anything I have ever, ever felt before. And I didn't know what was going to happen, if I was going to faint or if I was going to be okay to drive home. So I stayed in the supermarket for a few minutes, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes. And then I felt okay again. 
and I was able to, to drive home. But I started feeling dizzy um, with some frequency. Um, that, was, that became part of my days. Um, and some weird episodes started to happen to me. Um, I remember one day, one morning, when I woke up in my apartment um, with the, hearing the sound of a guitar. It was like someone was tuning a guitar or getting prepared to play a calm song. It was not really loud, but was enough to wake me up. But when I woke up, I realized that I was at my apartment with my boyfriend who was sleeping next to me and we didn't have a guitar and I felt confused. So I looked in every single room of the apartment looking for someone playing a guitar. I looked through, through, through every window to see if there was a neighbor or someone in the street, but it was too early and no one was there. I even opened my door to, to look at the elevator, how but no one was there and I was like am I going crazy what is happening to me and those hallucinations became more frequent and when I talk to people about it people just listen to me and told me oh we were stressed it's nothing you don't have to worry about it um, that changed when I talked to my mom. My mom um, had a sleep disorder diagnosis. So when I told her about those experiences, she took me, she, she, she told me that she was going to arrange an appointment with the doctor that diagnosed her. And we took a two hour flight to Sao Paulo to see the doctor. And he asked me a lot of questions about my routine, my symptoms, my life, and asked for some tests. So I did an elect electroencephalogram, an MRI scan, a daytime test, the multiple sleep latency, and a nighttime test, the polysonogram, which was the same test that I took years ago when I was a teenage, but I discovered that the test that I did when I was a teenage was focused on diagnosing sleep apnea. And the one I did when I was 24 was focused on the neurological area. So it's the same test, but um, different results came out. Well, then with the, the test results in my hands, I went back to the doctor and he told me that I had narcolepsy. He gave me a medication um, and I thought, oh, it's going to be okay. I'm gonna take my meds and live my life the way it was before, great. <laughs> but I realized that it wasn't true. I had to, to make some adjustments in my routine and I start, started learning how to live with a sleep disorder. Um, turns out that a couple of years later, I was um, coming home from a, a, a travel, a holiday travel with my boyfriend and we took an early flight. During the flight, I fell asleep. And when the plane landed, he woke me up and the weird thing happened. I was awake, but I couldn't open my eyes. I mean, my eyelids were, uh, um, they didn't obey me. I had no control of my eyelids and I told him what was happening. We waited until the plane was empty and then we had no other way, but we needed to, to get out of the plane. And he picked up all of our stuff. And when I stood up, 
I realized that my knees were buckling. So I had no control of my eyelids and my knees. <laughs> and then he was holding me, holding me up and carrying all of our stuff. And we, I was just buckling um, on my way through the airport with my eyes closed. He was leading me. I was desperate. I didn't know what was happening to me. I couldn't make any sense to that. And he couldn't avoid laughing at me because I, I think that was so weird, so uh, um, scared that he couldn't have a laughing. Well, um, sometime um, after that, we found a place to sit. And a few minutes later, I was just fine, like nothing happened. Those episodes became frequent and Somehow I realized that it was related to my emotions. Um, there was this morning when I was taking a shower and uh, in my bathroom there were a uh, window turned to the kitchen. And I was with the shampoo bottle in my hands. And when I was trying to put the shampoo bottle in the window, I just let the shampoo bottle fall into the kitchen floor. And I thought, oh, it's okay. I can pick it up after the shower. And then I closed my eyes to rinse the shampoo. And when I opened my eyes, the first thing I saw was that hand crossing the window with the shampoo bottle. And I screamed and fell on the floor suddenly and I couldn't move my body at all. And only then I realized that my boyfriend was in the kitchen and he was trying to put the shampoo bottle in the right place again. He was trying to help me, but I was locked in the bathroom and there was no one there with me. And he was so worried when he realized that I had fell on the floor, it's a dangerous situation. He asked me if I was okay, if I was hurt in any way. I told him that I was okay, but I couldn't move my body. I could speak, but I couldn't move my body. And I stayed in the floor with water falling over my head for 10 or 15 minutes until I was able to get up again. So when those uh, um, episodes started to feel more dangerous. We um, started to research about it, Googling, and then um, we maybe thought that it could be related to my narcolepsy. But by that time, the my neurologist was already retired and I had to look for another doctor. Um, we, me, my mom and my boyfriend um, took a four hour flight to the south of Brazil to see a neurologist that was recommended to us. And once there, this doctor told me that I had, that I didn't have narcolepsy, that I had a rare condition that could be treated with chemotherapy. So my mom couldn't help crying and we didn't know if this doctor was right or what was happening to me. So we came back home. I was feeling so lost, but I'm really lucky because my family never gave up on me and gave me all the support that I needed. And my stepdad found another neurologist here in my hometown. And after seeing my tests and asking me lots of questions, he told me, yes, you have narcolepsy, but it's not tied to narcolepsy. You have narcolepsy with cataplexy. So we're gonna find you a new medication to help you with those symptoms. And I struggled to find my, the right medication, but a few months later, I really found it and it was 
um, really nice to feel um, safe again, safe like I knew what was my condition. Well, turns out narcolepsy is a chronic neurological disorder that impairs the brain's ability to regulate the sleep-wake cycle. It affects one in 2,000 people, 200,000 Americans, and 3 million people worldwide. Symptoms vary by person and may include excessive daytime sleepness, um, periods of extreme sleepness during the day that feel comparable to how someone without narcolepsy would feel after staying awake for 48 to 72 hours. Um, before my diagnosis, I didn't realize that I had excessive daytime sleepness, but then I, I noticed that it was there. I even lost a job interview someday because I couldn't keep myself awake. So it's a big symptom, it bothers me. Uh, we have to live with it. Um, cataplexy is striking. Sudden episodes of muscle weakness usually triggered by strong emotions such as laughter, exhilaration, surprise, or anger. The severity may vary from a slackening of the jaw or buckling of the knees to falling down. The duration may be for a few seconds to several minutes, and the person remains fully conscious, even if unable to speak during the episode. So examples of cataplexy are the airplane and the shower episodes that I told you about. Hypnagogic or hypnopompic hallucinations are visual, auditory, or tactile hallucinations upon falling asleep or waking up. This can be frightening and confusing. Um, remember the guitar episode I described? It's an example of hypnopompic hallucination. Sleep paralysis, um, the inability to move for a few seconds or minutes upon falling asleep or waking up. It's often accompanied by hypnagogic or hypnopompic hallucinations. It's important to know that people without narcolepsy can experience these hallucinations and sleep paralysis. In fact, about one third of all people experience this at some point in their lives, usually during periods of high stress or poor sleep. For people with narcolepsy, these are much more frequent and consistent over time. Well, sometimes I really feel the, the sleep paralysis. Um, there was this time when I was at my bed and the, the noise from the TV was bothering me and I wanted to turn off the TV. I could see my hand and I could see the remote control just next to my hand, but I couldn't move my body. I couldn't move my hand, not even a little bit to pick up the remote and turn off the TV. It's scary. Um, disrupted nighttime sleep. Unlike public perceptions, people with narcolepsy do not sleep all the time. Timing of sleepness is off with narcolepsy, so one may fight sleepness during the day, but struggle to sleep at night. Um, remember how my night sleep used to be interrupted when I was at night? That's um, an example of disrupted nighttime sleep. There are two types of narcolepsy. Narcolepsy with cataplexy and narcolepsy without cataplexy. Recent research suggests that narcolepsy with cataplexy is caused by a lack of hypocretin, a key neurotransmitter that helps sustain alertness and regulate the sleep-wake cycle. Less is known about narcolepsy without cataplexy. Well, my diagnosis is type 1 narcolepsy with cataplexy, and my mom's diagnosis is narcolepsy type 2 without cataplexy. Diagnosis typically includes a 24 hour sleep study that includes a nighttime portion, polysomnography, 
and daytime net portion, mud post sleep latency test to record one's brain waves. The diagnosis is mainly based on how quickly and frequently one goes into rapid eye movement, REM, during sleep state during these tests. Um, there is currently no cure for narcolepsy. Treatment for symptom management varies widely by person, but may include waking, promoting, histamine directed, or stimulant medications to increase alertness in the daytime, nighttime medications to increase wakefulness and reduce cataplexy, antidepressant medication to decrease the occurrence of cataplexy, and scheduled daytime naps. Coping strategies vary by, widely by person, but may include social support such as meetup groups or social media, and improvement in general health and wellness through sleep hygiene, diet, and fitness. I take waking promoting pills and antidepressant medication every morning. I also sleep for a few more hours some days and take naps when I need to. I also found out that yoga helps me, um, help to keep me in my center and improves my sleep. And sharing experiences and feelings with my mom is one of the, the, the coping strategies that I use the most. I know I'm very lucky to have someone who understands my frustrations and my fears, and that's very important. Now, um, I have other people to share too, and that's great. So for a few years now, I'm living with narcolepsy and I'm learning how to live with narcolepsy. Um, as I said, I had to make some adjustments in my routine. Um, I never stopped working, but I, I'm lucky because I had support from my bosses and from my colleagues. And now I have flexible hours and I have, I can work from home and I have not, uh, some space here in my apartment to my home office. And all my team understands how I, how I, my routine works, how my hours can be flexible, how I have to nap sometimes, and how I'm a bit more tired for some days. And they are amazing. There's a picture of a cake my colleagues gave me for my birthday. There is even a sleep emoji. <laughs> um, I live now with my boyfriend and he's amazing too. He's very understanding. Um, he, he, knows, he, he, he knows that sometimes we can miss some social events and he's okay with that. He gave me my, my meds in the morning when, I, when he feels that I'm struggling a bit to, to wake up. He helps me almost every day actually and he's a great partner um, i'm also live with luna my pug and she's the great company i <laughs> the greatest company i could have for someone with narcolepsy because she loves to nap sometimes really close to my head as you can see in those photos and I can feel her love and the way she cares about me. Sometimes when I have a cataplexy episode and I fall on the floor and she stays by my side until I'm able to, to stand up again. She's just great. I also um, do the, the things I used to do before. I can dance, I can travel. I just have to make some arrangements to make it work, but now I know that I can live my life um, the way that I was with some caution, but, but it's okay. 
so I now feel that I can look um, to the future and work to achieve my goals. Um, I hope to build a family and I'm getting married next two years. So that's a big step. <laughs> and I uh, am also studying and doing my best at my work to achieve my goals and continue to growing professionally. And that's not something that I had to give up because of narcolepsy. Here I am <laughs> working for this. Um, because of low awareness, even among physicians and misperceptions, there is an average of eight to 15 years between narcolepsy symptom onset and diagnosis. It's estimated that the majority of people with narcolepsy are currently undiagnosed or misdiagnosed. Common misdiagnoses include epilepsy, depression, and schizophrenia. So I don't know how long my, my road to diagnose was because at first I thought it was quick because I thought it started when I started feeling dizzy at 24. But when I look back, I think that maybe it started when I was a teenage with my disrupted nighttime sleep or maybe with my child nightmare. I don't know. So I think it was um, more than 10 years until the, my final diagnosis, the type one narcolepsy. And that's not quick, that's a long road. And my mom had a long road too. And I'm here telling my story because I hope my story can help other, other people to have a quick diagnosis and find their treatments and have a better life. I hope we can raise awareness and we can work on that. Um, I hope people can hear us here talking about our sleep disorders and maybe pay some more attention to the signs of sleep disorders in themselves or in the people um, that live with them. I don't know. That's our role here. Um, I'm also hoping that we can bring down some stigmas and prejudices like people with narcolepsy are lazy or sleep all the time. That's not true. <laughs> And, and I hope to bring some light to sleep disorders here in Brazil. So the government realizes that they need to, to create public policies here because we need it. And that's what I'm working on right now. So I'm sharing my story today as a part of the Rising Voices of Narcolepsy a program of the nonprofit organization Project Sleep empowers patient advocates to share their stories and improve public understanding of narcolepsy. Thank you very much for listening to me. Yay! <laughs> Juliana, great job. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, if you want to go ahead and unshare your slides so we can just see us. Okay. Yay. All right. <laughs> um, well, I just want to congratulate you again on completing this program and uh, for overcoming so much adversity um, to get here. Um, and thank you for sharing your story. Um, it's so wonderful to meet a fellow lawyer with narcolepsy, with cataplexy, <laughs> um, and uh, but I have never practiced law. I got diagnosed while I was in law school and then took this other direction. Uh, and so I guess as folks, if you guys can think of questions that you'd like to ask Juliana, please type them in, but I'm gonna start with a few of my questions. So, um, 
I know you mentioned your job and that you work. Uh, can you just tell us a little bit more about what it's like to be a lawyer with narcolepsy? Uh, and, and where were you in your, um, had you already gone to school and you were already working when you got your diagnosis? Yes, yes. Um, I started those um, strong symptoms when I was in the beginning of my career. I was, I had ended my, my college and I was starting to, to lawyering <laughs> and it was um, hard at first because I was um, in, a, in an office that really needed me to be there eight o'clock in the morning and stay to 7 p.m and that became hard so i didn't stay there i had to travel to to do some tests and stuff but a few months later i started in a new job and they were really understanding and they let me work with flexible hours and sometimes from home and that was amazing that that was how i realized that i could work, but I had to, to, to make some adjustments. And now I'm really okay with this. It's amazing to see how powerful that is, being able to be more flexible with people um, can, can make things work, you know, that otherwise yeah. seem impossible. <laughs> We should. That's the future, right? I guess we have to be flexible in and understand people's lives and conditions, and then we can have the 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 best things they have to to give us. Well, that is so beautifully said. I, if if I didn't have a ton of other questions for you, I'd say we got to end there because that was so beautiful. <laughs> Uh, but what a powerful message. And I know I'm kind of skipping around, but I know that um, you have been helping Abrani, our amazing uh, patient organization, friends and partners in Australia. Um, and I know uh, I remember hearing uh, from Dr. Uh, Bahia there that um, they didn't have a lot of protections for employees. Um, uh, based on having a disability, the way that they do in America, there are certain protections. Um, and so uh, tell us a little bit more about your policy efforts uh, and what you've been doing with Abrani. Yes, um, the Abrani is our association here in Brazil. It's in its very beginning. So we are trying to, to build some some aware, awareness here to, to make some projects, but here in Brazil, it's really hard to live with narcolepsy. I know now that I'm very lucky because I have, uh, um, I have support from my family. I can buy my meds and that's, um, that's really big because the, the majority of people with narcolepsy here are unemployed or underemployed and they have no money to buy the meds. They are really expensive here and we, can, we can't have it for free. It's not provided by the government. The, the tests are not covered by the government uh, um, insurance too. And it's a battle to, to, to get a diagnosis. And after the diagnosis, it's another battle to find a job, to work and to buy medication. And the people I know that sometimes my, my neurologist introduces me and my mom to, to some new patients. And a few months later, a few months, um, Sorry, a few months ago, I met a young woman and she was just diagnosed with, with narcolepsy, with cataplexy, and she lost her job. She lost her fiance and her family um, cut the relations with her because they didn't believe that she was feeling 
those symptoms and that she was telling the truth about was about what she was feeling and the episodes she was having. So it's hard to to have narcolepsy here. And the Abrani is our way to 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 make it better. So we are trying to um, talk to our uh, representatives and to raise awareness in every way we can. And we are growing piece by piece. <laughs> and we hope we can make it better. Yeah, well, I'm so grateful for the organization there. I think they've been uh, probably the biggest advocates of World Narcolepsy Day and, and the efforts around that day and um, the passion of the community is so strong. And I know that comes from a lot of hardship, you know, um, passion. I'm so proud of them. So proud. They are amazing. Amazing, amazing people. So, um, so yeah, so thankful for, uh, for your work with them as well and uh, for all they do. So um I, uh, you mentioned that you got engaged recently. Yes. <laughs> and then before that, it was like a boyfriend. So how long have you guys dated? And, um, and what's that like? Uh, you know, I guess he was always kind of part of your narcolepsy story. Yes, because um, we met at school when I was 15, I guess. And we, we were friends for many years. Um, when I was 23, 22, 23 years old, we started dating and we've been together for 11 years now. <laughs> and we lived together for two years. Yes, two years this month. <laughs> and then we realized that it was time to, to officialize, to, to get married. <laughs> And we, we are going to, to marry next year in October. Oh, wow. He and in a big part of my story, he's, he's, um, he went with me to my doctor's appointment, to my tests, and he listened to my frustrations, to my fears, to my cries. And, <laughs> and he left with me because all the, the, the situations that we lived together, like um, there was a time when we were in a party and I had a cataplexy episode. I couldn't uh, control my neck. So we seated and I was just, I, I put my head in his shoulder and we stayed like this for a few minutes. And people saw us and, and told us, oh, you are such a loving couple. <laughs> you are so cute. And we laughed about it. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> making cataplexy look cute is kind of hard. And, and that's one of the situations, I guess, that you could kind of make it look cute. <laughs> <to leave>. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's really nice. Um, well, thank you. Big shout out to supportive boyfriend slash fiance slash soon to be husband. That's so exciting. <laughs> um, and, uh, so your mom having narcolepsy without cataplexy is such an interesting part of your story, especially, uh, as it, with her experience, uh, going to that, you know, uh, that trip where you went to go see that neurologist yes. and that neurologist, um, thought that it was something else, I guess, and, and represent and, and recommended chemotherapy. Um, it must be so weird because I think a lot of people don't have a family member with narcolepsy. Right. Um, yeah. and so to have that knowledge and still be shifted on your path, you know, in the wrong direction is, it must be so, it must've been so frustrating. So, um, just tell us a little bit more about like your experience with your mom having narcolepsy and like you know, um, how you guys might support each other or, you know, sometimes does it ever seem frustrating to have a mother with narcolepsy or, or how, what's the dynamic like? <laughs> um, uh, as, as a child, I remember some episodes when she didn't knew that, that she didn't know that she had narcolepsy. I remember when I was about three years old, we were at our farm, uh, our family's farm, and she was 
pick something to give me and she just um, passed out. And I was, I didn't understand. And I went to my stepdad and told him that my mom was in the floor and he came in, he told me she's just sleeping. And that was weird, but um, I, that's the memory that I had from my childhood. Um, a few years later, when I was a teenager, I remember that she took an important medication. I remember that it was um, target with uh, black, um, that's a sign here in Brazil of the medication, the medication that are controlled by the government. So I remember that she started taking this meds and that she, fit, she, she used to feel really tired some days and slept more than other people. And that was weird, but I only realized um, that she had narcolepsy and what that, what that was when she took me to, to the neurologist that diagnosed me. And I started talking to her, but I had some symptoms different from, from, the, from, from her symptoms, but sometimes they were the same and that was comforting. <laughs> um, and when she, she, she had the, when I had my diagnosis, she felt really bad, like she, gave it to me, you know, like it was her fault. And it wasn't. The, the doctor told us that it's not usual to have two people, mother and daughter or father and daughter, um, in the family with the same condition. But she felt that way. And when the, the, the other doctor told us that I didn't have narcolepsy, but I had this worst condition, she was destroyed, I guess. She couldn't um, talk to me. She was afraid to, to make me more scared than I was. It was really hard. And I could see her, the pain in her eyes every time I fell on the floor because she, she had no experience with cataplexy and knowing that I had narcolepsy and my narcolepsy was, I don't know, maybe worse than hers, um, that, made it, that, that made she feel um, really sad, I guess. But now she, she's okay because I can live my life. I, I adjust my routine and we help each other when we are sleepy or tired. We talk to each other, I'm so tired, that's bad. And maybe we, um, we, we laugh about it. <laughs> and now she's kind of proud of me because I'm here talking about our sleep disorders and helping other people when I think we are okay. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. You know, I think something that probably most people would say about narcolepsy, I've always said is that I would never wish narcolepsy upon my worst enemy, you know, yeah. you wouldn't wish <laughs> yes. it anyone. Um, and so then to know that you would have a daughter, someone that you love the most in the world, right? Your own child. With narcolepsy, it, I can imagine that it would be really hard to sort through feeling some sort of, you know, um, whether it's guilt or just like uh, feeling like you wouldn't want anyone to have this, never mind your own kid, right? Yeah. Um, but then, of course, the strength and kind of the maturity that we all tend to find through the experience, like adversity ends up having uh, benefits, but we never really want it, <laughs> you know? Um, <laughs> So that's incredible. I'm so glad that you guys have each other. Um, and she sounds like an amazing woman too. She is, she is she's the best. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so please let us know if you have any questions, guys. So we have people tuned in from Virginia, Alabama, 
California, Washington, and Mexico. So um, people all across America and um, our friend Alexis in Mexico. Um, <laughs> and so let's see, but no one sent over questions yet for you. So, um, oh, oh, and from Peru, we have Karina in Peru uh, who has asked, how do you deal with your sleepiness? What medicine do you take? So I take um, waking, promoting pills to, to be awake during the day. It helps me, really helps me. I take it every day so I can make my, my body um, work that way naturally. And sometimes even with my, my medication, I feel really sleepy. So I take some naps in the afternoon, in the middle of the morning, whenever I need to. Uh, or I sleep for more hours in the morning. I feel like I'm not gonna be okay if I wake up or I just can't wake up. And then I sleep for one, two hours more and that's okay. And I can get through my day. And do you, do, do any of your medications help with your cataplexy? Yes, the antidepressant medication. I, I take the antidepressant medication every morning too, and it reduces uh, my cataplexy symptoms. They are rare now, uh, uh, really uh, rare now, and it's more triggered by surprise now. <laughs> Um, oh, and so um, Boris wants to mention we have people in Brazil, of course. Yay! Yay. Um, and Alexa asks uh, a question. Alexa says, uh, can you speak about the process of getting accommodations in your job? And also, how did you tell your peers? Um, <laughs> it was, I, I'm really honest about everything in my life. That's just who I am. I don't know how to to lie and to start some relation with uh, um by not telling the truth i know that sometimes people with epilepsy need to to need not to 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 tell the 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 people that that they have narcolepsy because it's something weird that scares people. People don't understand what is narcolepsy and what we can and what we can't do. But I, I guess I'm lucky because every time I have a job interview or anything like it, I just say I have a sleep disorder and I can work. I, I, I have my routine and I deal with it, but I won't make it eight o'clock every day. I, I need my flexible hours because some days I'm going to be here early, some days I'm not, and some days I'm going to have to stop working for an hour or half an hour to take a nap, and some days I'm going to be very tired, and that's not going to stop me that's not gonna make me um, a professional that is worse than some other people without narcolepsy. And they understand, they believe me and they trust me, I guess. And here I am. <laughs> so I, I always, now that I have some experience working with narcolepsy, I explain that I can work from home because I don't feel secure to, to drive or to get out of my home, but I can work from home and I can, I don't know if I'm not working early in the morning, I can work a little bit more the other day or anything like that. And that works. I feel like we said this a little bit earlier, but this is hopefully the way of the future. You know, I mean, it should yeah. be that way that you should be able to work when you're at your best, no matter what that means for different people. And um, not, not just because narcolepsy, but because anything else. <laughs> right, right. Life is so complex and um, 
especially for work. I know for me, you know, some things are time sensitive, but for the most part, as long as something happens on a given day or a given week, you know, just try to remind myself the world's not going to end. Usually, you know, things will go on and, um, and the timing of that and always trusting that my energy will come back, you know? Yes. Yes. That's it. Uh, Alexa says the fact that you speak up about having narcolepsy the way you do in your job interviews is really inspiring. Um, thank you, Alexa. Oh, thank I'm you. Gonna, I feel like a big crier tonight. This is just so emotional <laughs> and meaningful. Uh, and we have Curly, Curly, hey Curly, and Curly's joining us from Kenya. So, um, so another country, country represented. Um, and let's see. So, if anyone else has any other questions, let us know. Um, I still have a few questions for you too. So I was wondering, how did you find out about the Rising Voices program? <laughs> I was um, on my Instagram looking for some pages about narcolepsy because I was desperate to, to know somebody else in, somewhere with narcolepsy because I knew only me and my mom. And um I couldn't find here in Brazil and then when I when I, when I started looking for something about narcolepsy in English I found you guys and that was a light in my life <laughs> I started um I, I visit your website and I looked for the your programs and I I saw the all those things you you did and that was amazing really 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 amazing i felt like we have so much to do so much work to do but you you accomplished a lot of things and i wanted so much to be part of it and that's how i'm here <laughs> Oh, I'm so glad you're here. Um, and huge shout out to Lauren, our programs manager. We can't forget Lauren because um, she works closely with Juliana to get her ready and all of our graduates this year. She's a huge, huge, huge part of this program. Um, and um, yeah, so, you, that's so <laughs> yeah. big shout out to Lauren. Um, so it is the holiday season. Um, and so I do have a little mini tree back here. I don't know if you guys can see, I just got this mini tree because I have a very special ornament. And so oh, I, I have one too. You do? Oh, there's my tree here. Oh, it's so cute. Oh, look at your little gnome. I love it. Oh, <laughs> I got to get a gnome for the top. Um, so. I have only one ornament on my tree, which is from Katie. Katie Williamson is another one of our Rising Voices graduates. And she gave me this because it looks like the World Narcolepsy Day logo. Yes. Balloon. Isn't that it's cute? It's beautiful. Yeah. So there's my one ornament on my mini tree. Um, but so as the holiday season, the most important question, what is your favorite holiday movie? <laughs> It's definitely love, actually. I love love, actually. <laughs> All those stories about people that love each other. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good choice. I feel like that's a good choice. Um, and um, did you say there was something about the wedding scene in that? Yes, I love the wedding scene when all those people who are playing all you need is love <laughs> maybe i can make it something like this in my wedding who knows <laughs> i love that um so i think i don't know my my favorite holiday movie might be the princess switch or it might be uh the holiday i really love the holiday the holiday is beautiful Yes. Oh, Alexa wanted to know if there's an organization uh, in Brazil. And yes, we there is Abrani is the acronym that we've been using. And, and we'll make sure to put a link to Abrani. Uh, and they are doing incredible work, Alexa. So um, they uh, are new. They've just, you know, uh, started a few years ago. So but they are powerhouse of um, of of working really hard and with so much passion in Brazil. So um, there is a great organization and we're so lucky for them. Um, 
And I think that's all the questions I have. I didn't realize that you, so you have Luna the pug now, um, but you grew up with a poodle. I grew up with a poodle too. <laughs> Poodles are great. <laughs> yes, Mini was my poodle. <laughs> so mine was red and it, um, I named him Clifford. Do you know Clifford, the big red dog? Yes. Yes, I do. <laughs> yeah, so I had a little Clifford. I had a mini poodle named Clifford. <laughs> oh, well, um, thank you so much, Juliana, for sharing your story tonight. This has been so special uh, and so meaningful. Uh, and we're just really grateful to have you part of our community and, and for all that you're doing. Um, and so uh, thank you for also, you know, um, showing through your actions, you know, what you can do and to make accommodations. That's really inspiring to so many people. So um, I think we'll go ahead and say good night for now. Uh, and thanks no. again, Juliana. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm really glad that I did this. And good night, everyone. <laughs> and happy holidays, folks. Happy holidays. Okay, bye for now. Bye-bye. <laughs>